Agik, and I welcome you to regular press conference on COVID-19. Today, we have uh, Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General. We also have uh, Dr. Maria van Kerkov and Dr. Mike Ryan. For journalists who are following us on Zoom, uh, we remind you that uh, there is a simultaneous interpretation available. And as of today, uh, we are proud to announce that we also have Portuguese in addition to six uh, UN languages, and that's uh, Russian, English, French, Spanish, Arabic, and Chinese. So uh, if you're on Zoom, please uh, look for interpretation and switch to channel you want, and you are welcome to uh, ask question in the, one of those languages if it's more suitable for you. Also, for the first time today, we have captioning uh, of, uh, of the press briefing. That's not on Zoom, that's on a social media platform. So for people who have hearing impairment uh, or uh, otherwise would like to have a captioning, this is now uh, available. I will give the floor to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks before we go to questions. Thank you, thank you, Mar thank you, Tariq. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. First of all, we're pleased to have interpretation services available in Portuguese today, and I would like to welcome all Portuguese-speaking journalists to join. The next will be Swahili and Hindi, and we will continue as WHO to invest in multilingualism because our beauty is our diversity. WHO remains committed to providing access to as much information as possible in as many languages as possible and reach every corner of our world. I have said since the beginning that the most important resource in the fight against COVID-19 is solidarity. Solidarity, solidarity, solidarity. The launch of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator on Friday was a powerful demonstration of that solidarity. WHO is deeply grateful to the many world leaders and partners who have come together to ensure no one misses out on life-saving vaccines, diagnostics, or therapeutics. We look forward to more countries and stakeholders supporting this global collaboration, this global movement. This initiative is a vital investment in the response, both for the short term and the long term. Diagnostics are helping us now to find cases and ensure people are isolated and get the right care. And we're hopeful that the solidarity trial will shortly help us to understand which therapeutics are the most safe and effective for treating patients. But ultimately, we will need a vaccine to control this virus. The success in developing effective drugs and vaccines for Ebola reminds us of the enormous value of these tools and the enormous power of nationals and international collaboration to develop them. WHO played a key role in the development of the Ebola vaccine, and we're doing the same for COVID-19. Developing a COVID-19 vaccine has been accelerated because of previous work WHO and partners have done over several years on vaccines for other coronaviruses, including SARS and MERS. Although COVID-19 is taking a heavy toll, WHO is deeply concerned about the impact the pandemic will have on other health services, especially for children. Children may be at relatively low risk from severe disease and death from COVID-19, but can be at high risk from other diseases that can be prevented with vaccines. This week is World Immunization Week, 
Immunization is one of the greatest success stories in the history of global health. More than 20 diseases can be prevented with vaccines. Every year, more than 116 million infants are vaccinated, or 86% of all children born globally. But there are still more than 13 million children around the world who miss out on vaccination. We know that the number will increase because of COVID-19. Already, polyvaccination campaigns have been put on hold. And in some countries, routine immunization services are being scaled back or shut down. With the start of the Southern Hemisphere flu season, it's vital that everyone gets their seasonal flu vaccine. Even when services are operating, some parents and caregivers are avoiding taking their children to be vaccinated because of concerns about COVID-19. And myth and information about vaccines are adding fuel to the fire, putting vulnerable people at risk. When vaccination coverage goes down, more outbreaks will occur, including of life-threatening diseases like measles and polio. Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, has estimated that at least 21 low- and middle-income countries are already reporting vaccine shortages as a result of border closures and disruptions to travel. So far, 14 vaccination campaigns supported by the Gavi against polio, measles, cholera, human papillomavirus, yellow fever, and meningitis have been postponed, which would have immunized more than 13 million people. The tragic reality is that children will die as a result. Since 2000, Gavi and partners, including WHO, have helped vaccinate more than 760 million children in the world's poorest countries, preventing more than 13 million deaths. Gavi has set an ambitious goal to immunize 300 million more children with 18 vaccines by 2025. To reach this goal, Gavi will require 7.4 billion US dollars in its upcoming replenishment. We call on the global community to ensure Gavi is fully funded for this life-saving work. This is not a cost. It's an investment that pays a rich dividend in lives saved, especially in our children. Just as immunization has been disrupted in some countries, so have services for many other diseases that afflict the poorest and most vulnerable people, including malaria. As you know, Saturday was World Malaria Day. And a new modeling analysis published last week estimates the potential disruption to malaria services from COVID-19 in 41 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. In the worst case scenario, the number of malaria deaths in sub-Saharan Africa could double. But that doesn't have to happen. And we're working with countries and partners to support them put measures in place to ensure that services for malaria continue even as COVID-19 spreads. As lockdowns in Europe is with declining numbers of new cases, we continue to urge countries to find, isolate, test, and treat all cases and trace every contact to ensure these declining trends continue. But the pandemic is far from over. I repeat, the pandemic is far from over. WHO continues to be concerned about the increasing trends in Africa, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and some Asian countries. As in all regions, cases and deaths are underreported in many countries in these regions because of low testing capacity. 
We are continuing to support these countries with technical assistance through our regional and country offices and with supplies through solidarity flights. In the past week, we have delivered supplies to more than 40 countries in Africa, and more are planned. Globally, WHO has shipped millions of items of personal protective equipment to 105 countries and lab supplies to more than 127 countries. And we will ship many millions more in the weeks ahead. And we're preparing aggressively. Later this week, WHO will launch its second strategic preparedness and response plan with an estimate of the resources needed for the next stage of the global response. I would like to thank the People's Republic of China, Portugal, and Vietnam for their recent contributions to WHO strategic preparedness and response plan. We are also grateful to the more than 280,000 individuals, corporations, and foundations who have contributed to the Solidarity Response Fund, which has now generated more than 200 million US dollars. And I thank FluLab especially for its contribution of 10 million US dollars. We have a long road ahead of us and a lot of work to do. WHO is committed to doing everything we can to support all countries. But political leadership is also essential, including the vital role of parliaments. As a former parliamentarian, I fully recognize the big role that parliamentarians can, can play. Tomorrow, I'll be participating in a webinar for parliamentarians hosted by WHO, the Interparliamentary Union, and the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction to discuss the role parliaments can play to reduce risks, strengthen emergency preparedness, and increase resilience. I continue to call for the world to come together in solidarity and national unity to confront this pandemic, but also to prevent the next one and to build a healthier, safer, fairer world for everyone, everywhere. But I repeat, national unity is the foundation for global solidarity. Solidarity, solidarity, solidarity. That's what we will say every single day. This virus will not be defeated if we're not united. If we're not united, the virus will exploit the cracks between us and continue to create havoc. Lives will be lost, and even every single life is very precious. We can only defeat this virus through unity at the national level and through solidarity, genuine solidarity at the global level. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, for these opening remarks. Uh, we are joined also by Dr. Somia Swaminathan, WHO Chief Scientist, who may also uh, answer some of the questions. I will remind journalists uh, online that uh, if you're on Zoom, you have an option of simultaneous interpretation in six UN languages and Portuguese. So welcome to ask question uh, in your language. Please be short and one question per journalist, so we try to get as many as possible today. I would like also to thank all the interpreters who are here with us and uh, making sure that uh, our message goes out in different languages. Uh, so if, uh, if we may start, uh, let's start uh, with uh, Jamil Chade uh, covering uh, Brazilian media and uh, he is Geneva-based correspondent. Jamil, please. Do we have Jamil on the line? Yes, I'm here. Yes, please go ahead, Jamil. Yes, Dr. Tedros, I'm going to ask in Portuguese, hi, before, but I'm going to ask in Portuguese so we can inaugurate the uh, service. Um, please go ahead. Portanto, minha pergunta é a seguinte, Dr. Tedros. 
É, como o senhor citou, existe um, um, fenômeno, um fenômeno da subnotificação. E, ao mesmo tempo, é, o afrouxamento é, da, dos, da, das quarentenas estão baseados nesses números. Portanto, será que não existe um perigo de haver um erro real é, para o afrouxamento do, dos confinamentos, das restrições, com base justamente em números que não são reais? Além disso, o presidente Bolsonaro disse que não tinha por que seguir as orientações da OMS, porque o senhor não é médico. Qual é a resposta que o senhor daria? Muito obrigado. Thank you very much, Jamil. The question is about easing lockdowns in Brazil. Sorry, excuse me. Um, I can't speak to the uh, <clears throat> specific uh, situation in Brazil. I know that over the last week there's been um, an overall increase in reported cases, but uh, I think about 50-60% increase in reported cases. But that situation may reflect different epidemiology in, in, in different states. Uh, Brazil is a, is a very, very large country. Uh, I think uh, we need to look at tra trajectory, at the direction of travel of the epi curve. Uh, because uh, the amount of testing is varying. Some countries, for example, brought on extra testing in the last number of weeks and their cases have gone up uh, temporarily and now their cases are starting to drop. That's absolutely true. Uh, if countries reduce the intensity of testing, then clearly the number of cases will go down. So in the, when, when there is a stable amount of testing or an increased amount of testing and the number of confirmed cases go down, I think you can be sure that that trajectory is downwards. And we would like to see that as a sustained downward trajectory of cases. We would also like to see the reproductive number, uh, the number of pa people that one person may infect to be one or less. Um, and there are all kinds of other parameters that need to be looked at. Each country has to look at its own context. I think we've said that a number of times. <clears throat> Each country has to balance lives <clears throat> against livelihoods. But at the same time, in doing that, be assured, uh, be assured that in making that calculation, that if the calculation is made and then the, the restrictions are eased too early, you may be back in a situation where lockdowns have to be reimposed. And that again has a an increased impact and potentially an even greater impact on livelihoods. So I think they're the real difficult decisions that all governments are faced with right now. Uh, and there are no easy answers. And I think we have to recognize that. Each government is dealing with a very different context of epidemiology, um, of um, expectations of communities, of, uh, of the epidemiologic context. Um, what we want to see is countries taking a step-by-step data-driven approach that allows a country to move steadily uh, towards a, a new normal, towards a, a new way of living that allows lives and livelihoods to return. But at the same time, not doing it so quickly that there's a rebound in cases which results in further lockdowns, which may e be even more damaging to those lives and li livelihoods that governments are trying to protect. If I, if I might supplement what, um, what Mike has said, so as, as he articulated, the, the lifting of any of these public health and social measures is, is not based on one factor alone, of course. It, it cannot only be based on the numbers of cases and deaths reported. And I, I think it's worth saying that at this point in the pandemic, I think all countries are struggling right now to identify cases and all countries are, are struggling to report the deaths associated with COVID-19. And that is to be expected um, because it is very challenging to identify all of them as you are dealing with a pandemic, um, as you are dealing with intense transmission in many countries. But in addition to the, the transmission that may be happening in the country and the numbers of cases and, and deaths that are identified, there's a number of other factors that must be considered. Um, which include the ability of the country to identify the virus. So whether it's a workforce 
of contact tracers to help find the virus, um, whether it's the workforce um, in your healthcare facilities, in your frontline facilities, to be able to deal with patients, um, looking at the numbers of beds available in hospitals for mild patients, for severe patients. What does that look like in terms of your ability to handle um, an increased burden if case numbers um, increase again? Um, making sure that if workplaces are open, if schools are opened, that those places are ready, ready to receive students again, ready to receive people back at work, where you can still manage physical distancing, where you can still manage um, the ability to, to keep people physically separated but let them work. Um, and it, and it, all, it requires having the entire population engaged and informed to understand that this needs to happen in a slow, measured, and controlled way. Um, and as the DG has said and has said repeatedly, this, this will take some time um, and, and this is nowhere near over. And we need everyone to be mentally prepared um, that we, we have some more to go. And that may require being more patient and, and, and having to deal with some of these measures um, that are, are difficult to deal with. So it isn't just case numbers and deaths alone. It's a combination of factors that need to be looked at so that a risk-based approach is taken to lift some of these measures. Yeah, thank you. So I'd like to say a few words. Um, on countries following WHO's advice, we can only give advice to countries, but one thing should be clear. We don't have any mandate to force countries to implement what we advise them. It's up to the countries to take our advice or reject it. But we give our advice based on the best science and evidence. Maybe one example is, as you remember, on January 30, we declared the highest level of emergency, global emergency, on COVID, COVID-19. Based on the international health regulation, WHO can declare the highest level of global emergency and we did that on January 30th. During that time, as you may remember, there were only 82 cases outside China. No cases in Latin America, actually. No cases in Africa. Only 10 cases in Europe. No deaths in the rest of the world, nothing. So the world should have listened to WHO then carefully because global emergency, the highest level of emergency was triggered on January 30 when we only had 82 cases and no deaths in the rest of the world. And every country could have triggered all its public health measures possible. I think that suffices the importance of listening to WHO's advice. And then we advise the whole world to implement a comprehensive public health approach. And we said, find, test, isolate, and do contact tracing and so on. You can check for yourselves. Countries who, who followed that are in a better position than others. This is fact. So again, I will come back. I can give you many examples, but I don't want to take much of this time because there are many people who want to ask additional questions. But one thing I would like to repeat is, I assure you that WHO gives the best advice we can based on science and evidence. It's up to the countries to reject or accept. But from our experience so far, what we have seen is some countries accept, some may not. At the end of the day, each country takes its own responsibility. 
And I repeat, we don't have any power or force to enforce our advice except the willingness of the countries to accept or reject. So I hope that's, that's very clear for any country, for any country. But one thing I would like to assure you is we will continue to give advice based on science and evidence. And then it will be up to the countries whether to take it or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is from uh, Antonio from EFE News Agency. Antonio, can you hear us? Uh, Antonio, just uh, to remind everyone, you need to unmute yourself to, uh, to be heard here. So if you can unmute yourself and then uh, ask the question. Gracias, Tarik. Um, mi pregunta es eh, sobre eh, la iniciativa ACT Accelerator que la semana pasada lanzó la OMS, en la que participaron numerosos líderes mundiales, aunque fue destacada la ausencia de líderes de gobiernos como Estados Unidos o China, que son precisamente eh, dos de los países donde parece más avanzada la investigación de vacunas y tratamientos contra la COVID-19. Entonces, mi pregunta es si la OMS teme que estos dos países en el futuro no compartan los avances que, que pueda haber eh, en este sentido y que, y que China y Estados Unidos se distancien un poco de la OMS. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Antonio. The question is about a, a vaccine initiative and mm -hmm. absence of, of some countries. Yes. No, thank you. Um, the absence of some countries, we haven't invited all countries. Uh, we have invited countries who have some regional uh, leadership. For instance, we have invited Saudi Arabia because it's the G20 presidency. And we have invited um, Germany because it's going to uh, take over in June the leadership of the EU uh, Council. And we have invited um, Malaysia because it's the chair of ASEAN. We have invited South Africa because it's the current chair of the African Union and on and on. Of course, there are some exceptions like France and um, 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 France and UK. It's because they were in the initial negotiation and this was the countries who have started the discussion at its infancy and also the leadership they have given until the launching of the, um, the um, launching of the initiative. But if you take uh, the countries I have just uh, mentioned, uh, they were uh, invited based on their role in their respective uh, regions because we cannot bring all, all countries. So China didn't participate or others because of uh, the same the same uh, reason. Thank you. If I can just add to uh, what the DG has just said, WHO works with a number of, through our expert networks and groups. And our expert networks have been working since the beginning of January on diagnostics, on therapeutics, on vaccines for COVID-19. And these expert experts come from all over the world. We have almost a thousand experts today coming from all of these countries um, that are working on things like animal models, standardization of assays, what are the ideal characteristics for a new vaccine, the design of clinical trials for both drugs and vaccines. And as you know, the solidarity trial is now in almost enrolling in 11 countries but we have over 100 countries, actually, that have expressed an interest and are in some process of joining. And this shows that this is really a global trial. We have 1,600 patients already enrolled, and, and we hope to now recruit patients in many countries very, very rapidly. As new vaccine candidates are developed, we hope that 
the same global collaboration will continue in the development, in the testing, and most importantly, in the access to these vaccines. Doesn't matter where in the world it's developed. There are over 100 candidates currently, which are at some stages of preclinical development. Seven candidates have gone into human testing. We hope that of these 100, at least a few will prove to be safe and efficacious against COVID. And it's in the interest of all countries to collaborate today because we don't know which vaccine is going to be successful. And we, we have to ensure that people everywhere in all countries have access to the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros and Dr. Swaminathan. Uh, we will go to the next question. And again, I will ask uh, when I call a journalist to unmute themselves. So it's uh, Dawn Kopetsky from NBC. Dawn, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. Dr. Tedros, a few weeks ago, you had said that America was doing a great job in fighting the coronavirus. On Thursday, President Trump said that um, he asked whether or not uh, injecting disinfectants into the body would help kill it. Um, there are states that are reopening government, uh, reopening services, um, even though there's no contact tracing in virtually any state in the United States, and we're about to hit a million cases. Can you tell me if you still think the United States is doing a great job? And if so, what is it that the U.S. is doing well? And what is it that we're not doing so well? Thank you very much for this question. <clears throat> um, thank you. Uh, I think the, the United States is, is dealing, as it has been for a while, with a, what is a complex situation. This is a, a very large country. Uh, with 50 states, each one with different uh, populations, with different levels of urbanization and, and the epidemic at different levels of development and evolution in each of those. Um, I believe the, the, the federal government and, and the system of governors uh, are working together to, 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 to move America and its people uh, through this very difficult uh, situation. Uh, with uh, with uh, public health and other scientific leaders uh, adding and, and, and inputting their advice into the system. And as such, as the DG just said, uh, WHO advises our member states on what we believe to be uh, rational policies. But uh, governments themselves, and especially in the United States with its uh, superb public health, health science and policy infrastructure, is well positioned to, to manage its, uh, its own transition from the uh, public health and social measures and has to balance, as I've said before, the, the, the health issues associated with COVID and the life, lives and livelihood <clears throat> issues. Um, we, what we, uh, what we, we can say is that uh, it's, it's important. I think there is a, a national plan. I think it has been very clearly laid out, a phased plan for a stepwise uh, reduction in public health and social measures. Uh, that plan is driven by certain parameters of data, like I mentioned before, downward trajectory of cases, the availability of capacity in the health system, and many others, as Maria said. It's a multifaceted uh, decision-making um, process, and, and that, uh, that framework exists. And uh, obviously, <clears throat> if that framework is being advised by top scientists, at a federal level, um, then obviously it is a discussion with the state system as how best to introduce that. But we believe that the overarching federal plan seems to be very much based on, on science and, and to the extent possible and with all of the, the adaptations that are needed as, as we move forward, we hope that uh, the US government and its people can, can move through that plan, work through day to day how to do that and will find a successful solution that reduces uh, the impact on people's lives and also on their livelihoods. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ryan. Uh, we go now to Azerbaijan to Kamran Kasimov from uh, Real TV. Kamran, unmute yourself, please, and ask the question. Do we have come? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes, please go Okay. Ahead. Greetings from Azerbaijan, from Real TV. Thank you, Mr. Tari. Uh, exactly, Azerbaijan following advices of WHO and uh, some of the special quarantine 
regime rest, uh, restriction have been lifted since the 27th of April in Azerbaijan uh, today, uh, I mean, and some of places, uh, photo studios and another shopping, mini shopping uh, now open, but big malls and another places, I mean, cinemas, theaters, schools, exactly, <coughs> not open this time. Please, uh, many experts say about the second wave of coronavirus in Azerbaijan. What do you think about that? Uh, if it is possible, if it is possible, Mr. Tedros, I want uh, your uh, uh, answer. Thank you. My question. Thank you, Cameron. I think it has been Thank touched you. upon, but um, yeah, Dr. Ryan will answer. Uh, I know that the uh, the epidemiologic situation in Azerbaijan is. Uh, reasonably uh, is stable. I think you have 1,600 or so uh, cases and uh, uh, I think 21 deaths reported at this point and, and the increase from last week is about 18%. Uh, so the, the epidemiologic situation, at least from where we sit, is, 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 is stable. Uh, and as governments around the world in a stable situation are looking to see how they can open up, um, there is always the risk of, as we move away from these um, public health and social measures. And remember, uh, as, the D, as, as the Director General said, these measures you know, had to be put in place in order to suppress what was a very, very rapidly developing and deteriorating situation in many countries. And uh, it's to the credit of governments and their peoples that they've managed to successfully suppress uh, the worst parts of the, the pandemic in their countries. The, the challenge now is how to unlock how to have an exit strategy that doesn't result in the disease bouncing back. And that bounce back can happen in another wave, um, and it, that wave can happen now, or it can happen in a month, or it can happen in two months. We don't know what's going to happen in two, three, four, or five months when we, uh, when we may see a, a re-emergence of the disease. We don't know what's going to happen. But what we do know is that if countries release the, those measures, if you release the pressure, and in a sense, the, the public health and social measures, the lockdowns, have created huge pressure on the virus. They're preventing the virus finding new victims. And in doing that, you're putting that pressure on the virus's capacity to survive. Um, and I think it's fairly logical that if you lift that pressure too quickly, the virus can jump back. Uh, and we don't know how quickly, and we don't know for sure which are the measures that will result in a successful exit strategy. We do know, for example, and I think everyone agrees, that large-scale mass gatherings are not a good thing. But what all governments are really uh, um, grappling with now is, well, can we open the schools or part of our school system at the moment? Can we open part of our economy, essential workers, construction, transport systems? Uh, and each country is having to look at the potential positive impact on the economy of doing certain opening, but also the potential negative impact in the disease bouncing back. And that to an extent de de is determined by the context. What is the urban population versus the rural population? Um, what is, are there, where are the high vulnerab vulnerable populations within uh, a given uh, society? So we can't prescribe from Geneva or from WHO exactly what each country can do. What we need to see countries doing is taking a measured, stepwise approach based on the data and replacing the public health and social measures. And I would like to emphasize this. Those measures need to be replaced by a new social contract with citizens around physical distancing, around personal hygiene, around community participation, with strong public health measures such as surveillance, case finding, contact tracing, quarantining, uh, as the DG said, detect, isolate, treat and trace. Um, and also uh, with a strong investment in the healthcare system. So if the disease does come back, the healthcare system will not come under the same pressure it may have come under before. So there are requirements that allow you to ease the lockdowns without having a tremendous danger of a negative outcome. But nothing is certain at this point, and that's why we're watching very closely each and every country to see what lessons are being learned. Uh, and we will ensure 
th those lessons are shared between countries. Just a few days ago, the DG, with all of our member states, we had six of our member states presenting on the lessons they've learned. Very different contexts, very different countries, doing sometimes very different things. Listening to each other to see, well, this is what we've done, here are the outcomes. This is what we've done, here are the outcomes. And it's that exchange of knowledge, it's that exchange of learning that I think is going to help us get through this successfully. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Just would like to add a few, few words to that. Uh, second wave, as Mike said, is in our hands. If we implement the right um, uh, intervention, uh, we can prevent it from happening and focused on public health interventions, of course, and the details that he had, he had said. But when we do this, not just the national interventions, having the regional, and also coherence in the global interventions and global solidarity is, is very important. And if we take Azerbaijan, I remember the recent regional gathering that uh, Azerbaijan hosted, and I had the opportunity to, to join. And when the countries in the region were, you know, decided to work together uh, to fight uh, this virus. That's very important. And not only that, uh, Azerbaijan also contributed five million US dollars to the global response. So I see strong commitment starting from the president, the national response, and the president also working with neighboring countries to have the regional response, um, uh, united regional response, and then contributing to the global response, even uh, financially and, and through other, other means. So I would like to use this opportunity actually to express my respect and appreciation to the leadership of uh, His Excellency, uh, the President, um, considering all the three levels that he's trying to be involved in and, and, and support. Um, today also we got another uh, uh, commitment to global solidarity and Latvia has contributed uh, financially to the global response. And I would like to use this opportunity again to appreciate uh, the commitment from Latvia. And also I would like to uh, inform you that uh, Latvia's response is al also very, very uh, strong to the uh, COVID. And what's happening at the national level is something that uh, really is bringing result in Latvia. But at the same time, their uh, contribution to global response is much appreciated, and thank you so much, Latvia, for that. Thank you. One additional point I wanted to add to what um, Mike and DGs have said is, is about this question around the second wave, and as, as the Director General has just said, it's in our hands. Um, but we are learning about this virus every day. Um, and while one of the important things that we are starting to learn now is the extent of infection in countries, and some of this comes from the surveillance, which is detected through the PCR testing. But there's an, an additional tool that we have, which is um, gathering information about the extent of infection through seroepidemiology, which is measuring the extent of infection in people who may have been missed through surveillance. And we detect the antibody levels in those individuals. And while I don't have specific details about Azerbaijan, we are learning from a number of countries that early results suggest um, that a large proportion of the population remains susceptible. And that's an important feature because that means that there still are people that this virus can infect. And so in addition to how we intensify the measures to increase you know, uh, the, the so-called lockdown measures, as well as lifting those in a controlled and studied way, it's really important that we remain vigilant that we remain vigilant to identify cases very, very quickly through all of the systems that we have been describing. And that early action, again, even if countries have been successful in suppressing transmission, it's important that they remain vigilant to be able to de detect those quickly and stamp it out uh, right away. So these seroepidemiology studies have been very important, um, even though they're early, even though there are some limitations with these studies that have come out so far, it's important that we understand at this point in time, four months into a global pandemic, a large proportion of the population still remains susceptible. Thank you very much. Um, so this was answered to
Kamran Kasimov from Azerbaijan and now we will go to South Africa. It's Dennis from uh, Network 24 TV. Dennis, uh, can you hear us? You would need to... Uh, yes, I can. Please, Dennis, go ahead. Um, my question is for uh, the Director General of the WHO. Director, I would, I would like to know um, what is the stance from the WHO on South Africa and how South Africa is handling this pandemic? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can begin, I'm sure. Uh, the DG will want to supplement. I, I we, Actually, as it happens, we were discussing this uh, earlier today. I think, uh, I think uh, there are a number of things. I think one is South Africa has, I think, used its uh, initial lockdown very well and put in place a four-point plan for preparedness and response. I think the, the deployment of 39 mobile lab laboratories all over South Africa has been a, a huge innovation. I think the training of up to 30,000 community health workers for doing uh, contact tracing, testing and, and other things. Um, I be also believe that South Africa is tracking closely the HIV positive population and actively looking to see if there's any differential impact on that population, which I think is very prudent and, and shows a very caring approach for a vulnerable population. Um, obviously, uh, like in, in any country, uh, South Africa is a large country, extremely diverse, and, and the disease has not yet reached the, the whole population, and there are large numbers of vulnerable people in South Africa. So South Africa, like every country, is not out of the woods, but I, uh, South Africa was the first country in Africa to develop its own capacity to do laboratory testing, um, and uh, also has given that gift to the rest of Africa through uh, the training it has run with the Senegalese uh, Institute Pasteur Lab and others. So South Africa is a net contributor to capacity building in, in Africa. Uh, and also uh, because South Africa is entering or will enter into the influenza season fairly soon with countries like Argentina, like Chile, like Australia, it's really important that we support countries in the Southern Hemisphere who do experience uh, uh, yearly influenza cycles to ensure that they have the capacity to both manage and monitor both influenza and COVID-19 at the same time. Because I believe the lessons that are learned uh, in the experience those countries will have with potentially both diseases circulate, circulating at the same time will not only benefit their countries, but will greatly benefit countries in the Northern Hemisphere who may face the same situation in six months' time. So we have a, a huge benefit to gain from investing in the capacities, the scientific, epidemiologic and other capacities in South Africa, which are, um, have been demonstrated already to be very strong. Uh, but I'm sure, as I said, that every country faces its own challenges. Uh, and I'm sure the lockdowns have not been easy for communities, particularly those in poor and vulnerable settings. But uh, uh, um, I, I hope I can say this without fear of contradiction. I think South Africa has really shown the way in Africa, and it's showing the way globally for how a country that has, uh, facing its own economic and, and, and other difficulties, has clearly demonstrated a very strong public health-led response to this pandemic. Uh, but still, nobody is out of the woods yet. Thank you. Um, I have been following as, uh, up developments in um, South Africa. And one thing that uh, we need to underline is its community, uh, uh, you know, based approach and the deployment of community health workers. That's one. And the other is, um, you know, on the risk adjusted strategy on COVID 19. Um, I got the information that um, there are now like 69,600 emails received from citizens, their comments, their inputs. I think this type of listening to communities, listening to their concerns, listening to their inputs can really help. To defeat COVID-19, the solution is making it everybody's business. And that's why, as WHO, we have always been saying, please break the barrier across party lines. Come together, whether you're in the left, right, or in the middle. This is about saving the lives of your people. 
So just unite as one. No party lines should really divide you. And listen to your communities. Listen to the citizens. Get their input, inputs on how to fight this outbreak or this pandemic. That's the solution. And truly, this kind of consultation with the community that South Africa is doing is very, very important. So please continue doing that, listening to your people, getting inputs from them, understanding their concerns, and all political leaders joining hands, working together to defeat this virus. So it's not an easy thing. I'm not saying it will be easy for South Africa, but the community-based approach, listening to the community and getting input from the community will really help. Whether it's getting emails like the 69,000 emails or other ways of inputting, getting their advice from the communities is very important. Our communities know the problems, know the root causes of the problems, they also know the solutions. Let's listen to our citizens. Let's listen to our people. Let's make this fight truly community-based. Thank you very much. Uh, next question is uh, from Ankit uh, Kumar from India Today. Ankit, uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ankit Kumar. Uh, I represent India Today. My question is, in India, scientists from two institutions have claimed that high fatality rate in some of the cities could be possibly linked due to a L-type strain of the virus. Is there any evidence to show that uh, the fatality rate is higher in this particular L-type strain? If you could please talk about it. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So um, there are a number, uh, we, we're working with a, a global network of virologists and laboratorians across the world that are looking specifically at the sequences of the viruses that are circulating around the world. Um, and there are more than 10,000 full genome sequences available. Um, I don't even have the last count, but at least 10,000 full genome sequences that are available. And we're looking at the changes in the virus to see if any of those changes mean that the virus has mutated um, and that it changes in terms of its transmissibility or its ability to infect people or its ability to cause severe disease. And so far, um, this virus is relatively stable. There are changes in the virus which are expected in RNA viruses, but these changes are within the expected range, and there aren't any differences in the viruses that have been found in different countries um, that suggest that it behaves differently in terms of its ability to transmit or its ability to cause severe disease in people. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, now we go to uh, Tania Valbuena, uh, N plus one, that's online science magazine for Latin America and Spain. Tania, can you hear us? Maybe you need to unmute yourself, Tania Valbuena. Hola. Hola. Please go ahead. Perfecto. Bueno, mi pregunta va especialmente con la notificación que hicieron el viernes de los pasaportes de eh, inmunidad que algunos países están realizando. ¿Qué evidencias científicas aún se necesitan para corroborar si esta información eh, es pertinente en este momento de la epidemia y qué otras acciones deben hacer estos países para reactivar sus actividades? Thank you very much, Tanya. The question is about immunity passports. So I'll start, and, and perhaps Mike or DG would like to supplement. So um, yes, there are some countries that are considering the use of a passport or a certificate, um, which would indicate that somebody has been infected to uh, infected with COVID-19 and has developed some immunity. And so what we're doing is we're working with, with labs to understand how these serologic assays are being used in individuals and what an antibody response, which is what those tests measures, means in terms of immunity and in terms of protection. Um, and so uh, there are a number of studies that are underway to look at the tests themselves to see if they actually do what they say they do. Um, and what we're finding is that individuals who develop an antibody response um, is developed about a week or two after infection. 
and we're trying to better understand what that antibody response means. Um, right now, there are no studies that evaluate the antibody response as it relates to immunity, so we can't say that an antibody response means that someone is immune. Having said that, there are a number of studies underway, and we, and we expect this, this is a very active area of research. Um, we expect people that are infected with COVID-19 to develop a response that has some level of protection. What we don't know right now is how strong that protection is, and if that's seen in everybody that is infected, and for how long that lasts. And so right now, at the present time, four months into this pandemic, we're not able to say that an antibody response means someone is immune. Saying uh, that there's no evidence in this area doesn't mean that there's no immunity, it just means that these studies haven't been done yet. And so we're working with, with scientists all over the world, with our partners, to really understand what this means for people who have mild disease, for people who have severe disease, and what the antibody response means in terms of protection. Um, yes, and if I could just add to that, I mean, the, the, the serologic tests or the tests that test the, the blood test that test whether you've had the infection, um, to a greater or lesser extent of accuracy can say you've had this infection. It's a very different question to say, are you protected 